Welcome to Lightwave Digest, the very first episode of this brand new podcast. My name is Michael, and with me today I have... Andrew. <laughs> this is going to be very confusing because the guests that we have for tonight share the same name as you. I'm used to it. Um, there's always more than one Andrew wherever I am. <laughs> So for tonight's show, we have a few news items and a very long interview with a very special guest. And that guest is, of course, Andrew Bishop. Not me. I'm the other Andrew. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, before we dive into that, though, uh, have you done or seen anything 3D related lately that you, sh that you can share with the audience? Something that has inspired you, maybe, or... Um, don't, not so much. I haven't been had time. Um, I've been just very busy at work. Um, but um, recently I've seen a lot of work by uh, Mark Warner. Um, his stuff's awesome. Um, and I've uh, been following so, along with some of his tutorials, um, you know, getting me a bit inspired, might do some things in the future, a bit, you know, along that line. And yourself? Well, I, not, not really. I mean, I'm, I'm very busy at work and, and that means that I... I have to focus on the on the, the tools and stuff that we use at work currently to actually make something happen, right? But I did make a lightwave related tutorial. I can't remember if it was one or two months ago, but it was for the PBR texture set node that uh, comes with DB and W, uh, their patron effort. Uh, so Michael Wolf coded a, a really, really na nasty, nasty, not nasty a really nice tool to streamline working with PBR texture sets uh, for, yeah. And it also actually works with, uh, uh, what do you say, with the UDIMs as well. So it's, it's super nice. Yeah, I've seen it. It's a fantastic tool. Um, I've been to some of his demos when he was going on about it originally. Um, fantastic. Um, so uh, let's uh, say what we'll move on to um, talking about what's happening in the news in Lightwave land. Since Lightwave has been dead for three years, there aren't a lot of news to talk about, except for the big thing that Lightwave Digital has now bought Lightwave from WizRT. But before we go into that, uh, I just want to briefly mention some things. The official Lightwave forums over at WizRT or old new tech uh, are now being archived and read only. Uh, any thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. Um, personally, I think it's a good thing. Um, it means that it's accessible for all the old users and we'll get something fresh and clean coming forward. That'd be excellent. I think I have read somewhere that the database from the Lightweave forums is so huge, so you can't really transfer them anywhere as well. So uh, I guess it's going to be staying there as an archive for information or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, ho hopefully they can um, keep that information around. Um, of course, it's also going to get out of date at some point. Um, you know, there's a lot of old, excellent Lightwave tricks and tips, which of course date. Um, some people are using older versions of Lightwave, so it's a great asset for them. And it's not like they can't just ask the questions again on the new forums. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think I think it's good to to sort of that that it doesn't continue because if if uh... Lightweight like Digital actually create their own forums, then there would be two forums to, to sort of keep track on instead of just one. And the one that you sort of go to for older news or older techniques or something like that, then you go to the VSRT forum. But if you're using 2020 and, and you know, the future stuff, then of course it would be, I mean, it, it has to be the, the new forums that Lightweight like Digital set up at some point. So I, I also want to bring up a couple of uh, tutorial make makers on YouTube. Uh, links in the description below, uh, so you can find them. Uh, so the first one is uh, Lightweight Salvation. He's been a long-time Lightweight user and teacher. He has a lot of good training material on his site, and he kept the fire going uh, during the last three years, you know, when, when Lightweight was sort of dead, right? Uh, on top of that, he also have a bunch of interviews with artists and some presentations from Create Expo, 
and uh, and it's all for free, right? It's not behind in a paywall or you know Patreon or anything like that. And uh, I, I think that is awesome that he kept this fire going. And uh, do you have anything to add to to that? Uh, certainly, yeah. Tony is a friend of mine, and um, I've, you know I've, I've, I was at the Create Expo. I've even given a few talks myself. So that's um, fantastic resource for the community. And yes, as as you said, it um, he really did a huge amount of effort behind the scenes, keeping everything going, um, keeping everybody enthused, and he's a huge asset. And hopefully, going forward, uh, they might use him a lot more. Um, and I certainly. I always interact on his his uh, Facebook com community as well as my own and uh, and the official one, of course. Uh, you know, it's um, he's he's a really fantastic asset to the community, and a, a few people have even said so on on his uh, Facebook group recently. It was rather nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, of course, there's another one uh, which I would say is a kind of a newcomer to to the Lightwave tutorial realm, but he has been using Lightwave for many years. It's just that. Uh, but yeah, let's let's take one thing at a time here. So his his name on YouTube is CDA Three D Live. Um, his videos are fairly well produced. Uh, the content that he creates looks good, uh, and it, but he doesn't have a lot of vi videos yet. And I think I don't know. I haven't counted now. Uh, you will see it in the video, but but uh, I can't remember the the number of videos. But it, there are two of them that are sort of one is for 3D Studio Max and the Chaos Render something I can't remember, and then there's another one for Cinema 4D. But the rest of them that he's made are for Lightwave, and the first very first video tutorial that he made was actually was it five or uh, yeah five months ago, which kind of is very interesting for me because you know five months ago pretty much everyone in the world were convinced that Lightwave was a dead product. You know, a few people knew that there were movements here and there, but the vast majority of the industry, well, Lightwave is dead, right? So it's kind of interesting, it's kind of interesting, you know, thinking about the fact that, oh, he found Lightwave and wanted to put out the video tutorials for it. So any, any, any idea, any thoughts on that? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's um, fascinating um, that someone, you know, someone's coming in relatively cold to the market, doesn't, uh, you know, and Lightwave at that point, as you say, was dead. I think it's um, almost like um, green shoots, you know, on, on Deadwood. There's, uh, you know, people are still discovering Lightwave, you know, it's been around for a long time. It's an old product and still it has a lot to offer. And that's the reason why Andrew and his team kept it and, and you know, fought hard to keep it and, make it fresh and new and and I think it's a you know fantastic um to see that people are still interested in it and it's not just going to be all of us old timers that there's actually new people and that's that's really good news. I agree. I agree. So, with that out of the way, um let's talk about the big news. Everybody's excited. Um everybody's getting really involved and there's a massive new community growing on Discord. People are getting very enthused about it. The the release of the news that Lightwave 3D has been bought out from under VizRT and uh, now is being made by the Lightwave 3D group or whatever it is they're calling themselves these days. They probably changed their mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, on the 4th of April, if you go back to exactly what happened was that on the 4th of April, uh, a lot of Lightwave users actually got this email from VizRT, which said something about uh, a new company called Lightwave Digital is in the final proceedings of, of sort of buying Lightwave. And here's a link to a Discord server. <laughs> uh, Very mysterious as it was. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, it was surreal in a way. I was like, because, I, you know, I had sort of given up on, on, you know, there was like a very tiny percent of hope I had left. But I was sort of, you know, am I going to, you know, move on to Houdini or Blender or you know, whatever, you know. Uh, and then this news come in and I was like, yes, yes. But then, you know, when I joined the server, I, you know, until the, the actual, you know, until the actual, what do you say? Uh, because this was still the final proceedings, right? So, uh, 
it was still I still came in there with a feeling that this might not still be true, you know. Uh, it, you there was sort of... definitely a, a raw edge to it. Um, it could have just collapsed. The whole thing nearly did collapse quite a few times before it eventually managed to be, you know, completed. Um, I watched the roller coaster behind the scenes. I knew there was something happening, and I was getting, you know, it's, it's so many times to have heartbreak. Came, you know, it was going away. It came back. And the time team, you know, finally put together a package, managed to, you know, achieve, you know, mutual um, agreement with VizRT. And, you know, even I was, you know, even I, I knew it was happening, but it was, it was crazy. You know, we were thinking it could just fail. And, you know, I'm so excited now that it has actually gone through finally. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and what do you think about the news that they actually posted? Because then we we wait, we had to wait to May the 4th, right? And then they yeah. had this live event, and uh, they yeah they showed some some cool stuff. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, they I mean they were very very um, circumspect about what you know what they were going to release, but they showed us the geo nodes, which are really cool looking. Um, hopefully, we'll get to hear more about that soon as they well develop it and uh, give us more official press statements. But um, yeah, it's it sounds very exciting. They're keeping it. Very close to the chest, only little hints here and there. See what Andrew says later on. That sh should be, you know, really cool. Uh, maybe he'll drop a few more hints. <laughs> see what he says. See if he, he breaks any more NDAs like he did the last time. Uh, doing, the, well, it was their own event, and he owns the company. So there you go. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited myself. It'd be fascinating to see what they do. Yeah, and and the thing is that the geonodes. From my, I don't know exactly what geonodes are. I do know that they exist in Blender and stuff like that, and yeah. it's a very versatile sort of set of functions that you can do. But what they actually showed was the real-time boolean. Yes, that that's the type of thing that you can do. You're basically taking two objects and subtracting or adding one to the other in real time in layout. That's really impressive stuff. Um, I didn't know that that type of thing was possible. Now it is. Um, let's see what they build from that. Oh, yeah. So tonight's guest, Andrew Bishop. Um, I've known him a few years. I met him at the Create Expo, you know, which I mentioned earlier. That was my first time meeting him. Um, I didn't know back then that this was going to be the case. I didn't know that Lightwave was, you know, going to be fated in the way that it was. But he's been a very long time passionate user of um, Lightwave. And I think we'll see that in the interview. Um, have have you had much interaction with him before now? No, I mean, for me, I sort of knew about him from a couple of demo or, or what do you say when he actually did some demonstrations of hypervoxels uh, for Lightwave. Mm. I've seen yeah. some recordings from ZGraph where he sort of, you know, helped pre present presenting that stuff. I also see seen a video with him and another guy from Darkside Animation talking about you know, why they use Lightwave and stuff like that. And also, I remember they were also speaking a lot about the, you know, when the linear color space workflow came into Lightwave 10. Yes. And they, they actually worked on the Iron Maiden uh, uh, music video with awesome. a di digital Eddie. And, you know, and they said that, that they, you know, the, the, the linear color space workflow, workflow helped a lot to, add in you know that extra uh, what do you say crunch or not crunch but but extra bits in the darkness so you can bring it up, up or bring it down you know and it doesn't screw up the image right yeah yeah it adds a yeah. huge amount of um improved performance and uh you know for low levels of lighting um it was a very transformative era in lightwave definitely yeah so yeah so that's that's pretty much the only thing i sort of knew about him and He's a lot, very long career. I mean, I, I knew also about him working with movie visual effects and, and TV, television shows and all that stuff uh, yeah. throughout the years. But I have not actually have any, had any interaction with him uh, until this interview, actually. So yeah. super, super, oh. super cool to, to have him on, to be honest. Amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and I'm very excited to um, talk to him again. So let's get on with the show.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first interview for Lightweight Digest. Uh, we have Mr. Andrew Bishop here with us today, the first guest. And as you know, he bought uh, Lightwave from VisRT in, in New Tech, and he has formed a new company called Lightwave Digital. And uh, wel welcome, Andrew. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> so good. if you could go through like your first computer experience, like what was that and, and um, how old were you and, and was it games or what, you know, all that stuff. Take us back. Yeah, the beginning. The beginning. What made me start this foolish venture? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, um, so I was probably in my, I, I would think probably my mid twenties. I, I think I was, uh, so I, I was originally um, in publishing. So I think from about 19 onwards, I'd, I'd been uh, uh, going up the ranks in publishing. I was group publishing director uh, my last job, uh, when I first bought an Amiga, basically, was uh, uh, I was group publishing director for Robert Maxwell running the Irish Tatler Group in Dublin. And uh, um, and then I, I kind of bought an Amiga to do music, which was largely a hobby at that point, um, and uh, using bars and pipes. And after I'd finished in publishing, I really didn't want to go back into that world. That was, uh, uh, I mean, if you've ever worked for a big publishing company and in particular Robert Maxwell it was uh you know difficult you know you were, you would get a call um you know sort of 10 o'clock at night and you'd have to go and close uh, a print company or do something horrendous the next day and uh um when you're 20 in your 20s uh, that affects you and you if, and if you're a reasonably decent human being even if the money's fantastic and the money was fantastic uh, you you kind of don't, you know, it wasn't something I really wanted to continue doing. Anyway, long and short of it was I, I started doing some uh, demonstrations of uh, when I left uh, uh, Maxwell, I started doing some music demonstrations and, and bits and bobs um, for Commodore. And I met uh, Anthony Jacobson. And I think I actually at one point was running his sales and marketing uh, did that for a long time as well. Um, and then I, I uh, in between sort of doing those sort of things, I met Melissa Jordan Gray, uh, Gray who was the founder of uh, Blue Ribbon Soundworks, I think they were called, with Toad or Faye. And um, I, she saw me demonstrating her software and had come over to see it in uh, one of the trade shows for Commodore. And they offered me a job. Uh, running the sales and marketing worldwide, and I moved over to Atlanta and got heavily into the uh, Amiga at that point, and um, uh, obviously demonstrating the software. And one of the things which was unique about Bars and Pipes, actually one of the things which was unique about the Amiga at that time, is it could multitask. So oh, yeah, yeah. you could run, um, uh, uh, you know, a piece of music software in sync with, at, we were doing it with the video toaster, that was being used and had already been used for doing the presentation to win the Atlanta Olympics and was being used for doing the opening ceremony of the Atlanta Olympics. So I got very heavily into, you know, at the amazing power of an Amiga. And, and uh, so they were able to do things like um, not just run the video screens and sync all the video interviews for uh, the presentations and, and for the live event, but also the lights. So they could they could control the lighting gantries, uh, everything. And then all the music, which was MIDI controlled by the bars and pipes part of the program, in sync, that would be controlling all the music as well. So bear in mind, that was a, a computer right back at the beginning. None of the others at that time could multitask and none of them could do those things. And one of the pieces of software in that uh, uh, suite of software was uh, a small 3D program, which was Lightwave. And uh, so they'd used it for doing the titles of the shows and putting together all the graphics um, for the both the presentation for the Atlanta Olympics. And then after I'd left, they used it for the um, actual uh, opening ceremony of the Atlanta Olympics. And anyway, I was there, uh, loved it over there, um, loved working with uh, Melissa and Todor, fantastic uh, 
or geniuses, really. Uh, just a quick uh, a sidebar, and I know you said be quick, but it's just an interesting thing. They were so clever. They had a piece of software called um, Super Jam on the Amiga, and it could auto write music. And um, that core engine was was later on. Uh, they got bought by Microsoft, and that core engine became the music engine that drove the Xbox. All the games across the Xbox box was uh, their technology. Wow. So super clever, very very bright people. Um, so that was it. So that, that's what got me into the Amiga and uh, uh, and got me into you know that sort of side of things. What what type of Amiga do you remember? What type it was? Was it an Amiga two thousand or four thousand or maybe you had all of them at, at some point? I, I I remember my one was only a five hundred. Okay. Because I couldn't. I didn't, I yeah. Didn't. yeah. I, in the case of not folding, I think at that time I didn't think I needed any more than that. I was just using bars and pipes. But but uh, over there, I think. Uh, what well, it probably was, they probably, I would say that's after the 3000, so it's probably the 4000, um, which was the, the less pretty of the two. I mean, the 3000 was a beautiful machine. The 4000 was a bit more practical, <laughs> let's say. <laughs> it's a lot more yeah, helpful. Well, they had a it set, didn't it? Yeah, it was, it was, so I think it was probably the 4000s we were using over there. Um, and I remember getting one when I came back, so so I got a four thousand after that. But um, uh, yeah, so I think it was a four thousand, and the uh, that allowed you to upgrade the RAM, the CPU. Again, one of the great things about the Amiga is you could upgrade the CPU, you could upgrade the RAM, graphic card, everything. Yeah. And uh, but it was good, good out of the box. But if you wanted to put in a better, you know, graphics card, you, you could do that. The the, the first three D cards. Um, was it a 3DFX card, I think, um, uh, by Voodoo or something? I can't remember. But it was, anyway, we had a, a, you know, those cards uh, for accelerating the, the graphics and uh, it was just extraordinary capability. But even today, I think, you know, the, the, I mean, now you can multitask really well, but probably only you know, in the last 10 years could you do all of those things at once. Uh, and it's, Shaking his head, you're probably right. Maybe not, <laughs> but the, but the, yeah, dodgy. But uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly, I, I'll give you a prime example. I'm, I've got Logic on the machine over there, and if you run two Logics at once, it starts to crumble. So it doesn't know which one is the lead. So if you switch to one 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 of them, it will switch off plugins on the other. And it just doesn't handle it well. So you start to get it crashing, and you. So if you want to copy a piece of music from one to the other, you it's very it doesn't work stably. It works okay, but not stably. Well, on the Amiga, you could copy stuff from one program to another seamlessly, and um, so uh, so I suppose actually that answers that question. I think even today, if there was a modern equivalent of the Amiga that was uh, had modern chips, its architecture was way ahead of its time. Just an amazing. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I actually, I actually own uh, an Amiga One X five thousand, which is wow. It's actually from it's a motherboard from two thousand and sixteen. Right. And uh, it's using modern stuff. I, I use a, an AMD graphics card, and and I have some you know, um, what do you say, regular like uh, audio boards and stuff like that. It's it's super nice actually, but, yeah. but of course, the, and Amiga OS is is of course fantastic, but but. Yeah, it's a very, very niche machine and costs a lot of money for what you get for it <laughs> compared yeah, to... There's not, not really any software on it these days, but it, it was a, well ahead of its time, the Amiga. It was brilliant. I had a 1200. Yeah, yeah. 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 Back then, it seemed like you, if, if you wanted to do 3D back then, there were sort of... You had Lightwave and uh, the Amiga, you had Imagine and stuff like that, but there were, wasn't that much on the other platforms except for the Silicon Graphics. So you had to yeah. sort of get an Amiga or a Silicon Graphics, uh, which is kind of crazy when you think about the history of of, of Lightwave, for yeah, example. The market, then, the market then was highly polarized. I think the so when when I when uh, once I once I started um, the animation company here, you know that, they were the two choices. So it's either Silicon Graphics. I think they just had bought out the the, the small Silicon Graphics, which was the O2. Which was the 
the small little box, probably about that high, quite fat. Um, Is that uh, very silver? Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, but yeah, it was two tone, I think. Okay, anyway, I can't quite remember, but uh, but anyway, that there they had um, that one, and then they, they had the challenge, which was the big massive machine, and uh, and then one in between that on it, the onyx. I can't remember. Anyway, so, was that um, the Irick? Irix was, or something like no, that. The Irix. I vaguely remember my university had some uh, silicon graphics Irix servers. They were quite impressive. Well, nearly all of our com or competing at that time was against silicon graphics uh, based companies. And it, it was what Lightwave. So it, I think I, I think Imagine was my first, and Real 3D may have been my first, but Real 3D or Imagine, certainly I knew those two packages. Not not brilliantly well. I just knew them and had played with them. I think I, out of the two, I went down the real 3D route first. Um, even though I, I, I'd seen the Lightwave and used that, came back to the UK. I think Andrew Gould, who I set up Premier Vision with, was uh, he was he sort of wanted real 3D. I think that's why we went down that path initially, and that was good. You know, it was fine, but it was a little clunky. Um, what I think drove me really with Lightwave was the the simplicity of the animation interface and how fast you could animate in it. And it, it, it kind of just made sense. Everything you did on it just was fast and quick to do. And obviously, if you look at the one back from then and you look at the one now, actually, it, it, it actually hasn't changed in its capability of speed of interface. The problem is, the quantity of buttons scares people a bit, I think. But you, but if you, uh, I mean, one of the, the you know, things uh, uh, we'll obviously look at at some point is there should be a starter interface for Lightwave, whereby you have much simpler uh, control interface for people who are just beginning. Because actually, that interface is the interface that that does everything you want it to do. I mean, it's. Um, you're looking through the camera, you animate its WYSIWYG, which is, you know, what you see is what you get. There's nothing in the way of that for the vast majority of the screen. And the keyframing is just, you know, obviously two enters on the keyboard. It's super fast. Um, the timeline's very simple. Uh, I suppose that's, that's, you know, whether you add things to that longer term is another issue about where we go. But the core functionality of Lightwave is about speed, and uh, getting your animation done in the fastest possible way. And I still find that the case today. And it, it's, uh, I, I know this is again moving on a bit, but, uh, and we'll come on to it later on, but when you look at the other packages, um, even now, actually, if you go to Blender, you don't have a full, you have a little frame showing you what the camera's seeing, right? And it, 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 that's fine, it works great. But it isn't perfect, and it isn't you know what I want the animation interface to be. I want the animation interface to be as simple to get to. The only thing that matters, by the way, when you animate, is being able to see what you're doing, and exactly how it's reacting, and then how fast you can render and look at that. And everything else is about you. You learn is about uh, then complicating that, right? But the core animation principle is move an object where you want it on screen, start, middle, begin, end position, uh, uh, keyframing that. And that's the basics of pretty much all your animation. And all the other things that complicate the screen, you know, having the ability to see it side, left, right, which was, if you remember with uh, real 3D and um, Imagine, you had, again, more complicated interfaces. And, and often with the newer stuff today, they are effectively a compromise interface. They are trying to put everything into one interface, which I know has some benefits, but it also has some big downsides. And for me, from an animation point of view, I want to be able to just see what I'm animating as fast as I possibly can. Anyway, the sidebar. But, yeah, uh, uh, but I think it's once, once, now that we're talking about interfaces, I do remember during Lightwave 9, they introduced, you had this, when you started it, you had like as a basic menu system as possible, but then you could, if if you were were an advanced user like I was, I could use load something what was called Studio Production Style, which was a preset, a menu preset 
that actually just added all the tools that that you know that you know as you said a newcomer will be like oh shit there's so many buttons here but uh, uh if you have like a system where, where where as you said if if you can actually have uh what do you say a, a simple interface or a preset for that where just the keys you need or, or buttons you need yeah i think that's a good idea to actually try to reimplement that uh in in some capacity i would say yeah i mean it's it's it, you know there's there's better ways today of having overlays there's i mean obviously screens are bigger as well so where we used to be on 17 inch and 18 inch and 19 inch monitors uh, and everything was sort of hd or below obviously now we can have 4k even 6k monitors so you have more screen real estate so you can do more with it but and likewise you know two screens three screens whatever you quantity you want i still tend to find however big the screen i have i want that to be my man and you know the whole animation interface right so um so i might squeeze it up to put some other things on the side but i tend to use whatever space i've got for animating uh, and that's just purely that's how i like to animate and uh, um but that's, that's a preference thing i think there's different animators like different things I, that's me um uh you know it's, it, it, yeah I, I i much prefer that uh, that you know i want to have as much screen real estate for the animation interface as i possibly can have and then it's down to refresh speed um you know the graphics card handling of that and uh, uh those sort of things are very very important but the as far as the interface you're using uh, that's my default interface and then i customize it with some other menus you know octane and uh, turbulence and a few other bits and bobs on there mm, um yeah. as standard but uh, but that needs probably an overhaul to be fair yeah. you know it probably needs to be updated uh, that that menu because no one's really looked at that probably for 15 years 10 years i don't know a long time so with the great development of blender for the last five or eight years or something like that when i think that's where it started to take off at least um, the latest developments has been fantastic with blender but there's one thing here that i'm sort of curious about uh, what are your thoughts about why individuals and studios still pay for 3d software i suppose uh the thing from my point of view is in my current guys in the animation side i have now um which is i work for a company called quantum digital um which is it largely does engineering visualization um but the guys i've got working there work on rhino uh, Maya, um, Blender, um, but also Unreal, Unity, you know, across the board. So uh, you kind of uh, you get to know all of the strengths and weaknesses of those. So obviously Blender has done remarkably well. But what I think one of the things you've got to think about with which made me it made me think, you know, why would someone want to stay with Lightwave? Why would someone want to Come back to Lightwave, and the thing with um, Maya, and this is not meant as any kind of dig. And let's talk about a core principle of a Maya type piece of software, rather than Maya specifically. That's a bit cruel. But so, a lot of the users I've met for quite a few years, a lot of the guys online, a lot of the people I chatted to on the on that piece of software side, cannot stand the fact that they are charged a large amount of money every year and get minimal upgrades. And that's because that piece of software dominates actually a massive portion of the market. And, and it is a huge portion of the market it dominates with, right? So there's that. So it's basically hit a point where it's so good as an overall piece of software that basically it's used by engineering companies, used by film companies, TV companies across the world for a large portion of production. but they get very little upgraded each time an upgrade comes out. And when they do get an upgrade, it's very poorly documented. So in the case of the, the soft homage, taking out the particle system of soft homage and effectively making that plug into Maya, they did it. And when they first launched that, they had no documentation at all. 
So you had to know that piece of software in order to be able to get to use it or trial and error, you know, do it. Now, if you're producing a piece of software that costs, uh, you know, a lot of money, you know, the least you can do is then produce something to make it as functionally easy for people to learn uh, as it's being produced. And you need to give a shit because if you don't give a shit, what happens is those people start wanting something else. So then you get uh, uh, the next piece of software and there's very little other other option so if you're a mayor user you've had soft image which was the newer core piece of software should have been the one that carried on actually so you have soft image great piece of software they buy it fundamentally they keep their promise keep it going for five years or less i can't remember and then they axe it right so it, it that's the newer core engine better than mayor they still get rid of it right so you, you've shot all those people and they promised when they did that, that they'll keep soft image supported or able to be active on your computer. But actually most of the operators who have soft image have had real problems keeping it going uh, on their machine. And subsequently they then have to move over to Mare and then they are getting charged for minimal upgrades, right? So that's that's that part of it. And 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 I'm talking, I am talking in generalization. I'm, I'm talking about Mare only from the point of view that's what, a lot of end users have said to me so they they have all been saying to me actually if we had something we could move to we would but the problem is what do you move to so that's the first point so then then look at blender so blender is a free piece of software and it has taken a long time to get it from where it was to where it is now and those upgrades are not mega fast so yes it's excellent right now it's it's a great piece of software it does some stuff brilliantly but if you're a character animator and you've done a piece of character animation and you want to go back and alter something on that uh, on the character uh, actually very difficult to do so it's good for certain areas not so good for others it will be improved it's always going to get better it's fantastic but again a lot of the plugin developers when you create plugins for um, that piece of software, you are expected to, again, have that as open source so that other people can then access and, and control your software. Now, that's a bit of a problem. If you're a programmer creating a plugin, uh, it means that you, you can have other people have access to your code. I'm not sure that's such a great idea. So that limits the kind of people who are going to develop for it. And it's going to it's going to limit some of the plugins that will be available for it. Now, right now, it's good, uh, uh, which is great, but it has taken a long time to get there. So, my, if I was buying that software, does it do the character stuff as well as I'd want it to do? No. Nope. Does it render as well as I want it to do? Absolutely. It's got great render engine with cycles, and uh, uh, does it animate the way I want to animate? The, I want the interface to be. Nope. Um, but it, it animates well. Uh, it does instancing brilliantly well. It's got some fantastic modeling, tools, well, awesome tools. So I would say it's probably, you know, right up there, uh, sort of as an 80%, 70% uh, towards Mare, uh, that piece of software. You've got Houdini as well. Now, I'm not going to include Houdini in any criticism because Houdini actually is fairly niche. It's probably the best particle um, system around fluid dynamics and, and whatever, and it does it exceptionally well. It's wonderful to to get that kind of stuff out of it. As an overall animation system, it is massively improved over the last seven or eight years, uh, and it's a great that's a great piece of software. So I, I would I would say that one there I actually look at that and think, yeah, that's that's darn good, right? Got a, it has some flaws, but it's good. Um, I, uh, by the way, I think Blender's good too. So uh, I think um, Maya's good too. Well, Houdini's so. not really a general software, though. That's the difference. You know, if you're looking for somebody who's looking for a general purpose platform, Houdini is a specific platform that's incredibly good. It's like the best in the industry at doing very specific things. But from a general user perspective, it's 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 a lot. And people yeah. hide from that. Yeah, it's a lot of money. And also it doesn't do everything really well. It does... Uh, certain things the best in the world i would say so so excellent piece of software so uh, but you're right Andrew. i think that the 
um, uh, that's that's a good point. I suppose I'm trying to be as polite about that as possible. It's it's an interesting point. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who I haven't seen for a while, and he actually works for um, Epic hmm. on the Unreal Engine. And he was just saying that he wanted to do a modeling project on Blender because, you know, he didn't have a main um, product at the time. So he just said, well, Blender's free. And he was like, actually, it isn't free because he said, well, I just I needed to get this plugin and need to get this plugin. And he spent about £200 worth of plugins to get the features that he wanted to be able to do the operations that he wanted. So it's a bit like people say, oh, Blender's free tech, but it isn't free. Ooh. And yes, you can technically download all of that from the repository, but him being like, well, no, it's it's not fair. I should pay these developers the money for the plugins because they aren't free. So when people say it's free, it, it isn't free at all. And you, like you say, you might go, oh, well, you just download this animation plugin, which improves the animation so that it's as good as this. And you go, oh, well, then it's not free then, is it? Well, the, the, the other thing is also, if you think about the, a lot of the developers are working part-time developing mm. programs, so they're not full-time coders. And if you have full-time coders, you've got to pay for it. So if, you, if you're going to have a fast development path, that is going to cost you money, but you're going to get features quick and fast. You're going to get repairs quickly. And longer term, you should have a, a system that's more advanced going forward uh, you know, and, and be developed quicker with the particle system with Lightwave and Hypervoxels. I remember thinking, holy shit, I'm going to lose my company if on this film I don't deliver that shot. And at the moment, there's a bug that's stopping me render it, right? rendering it. Now, very fortunately, I knew Tim. Tim would basically put me directly in contact with David and David would work with me for a week, two weeks, whatever it was, debugging a piece of software that enabled that then to become functional, which enabled me to finish the job and not lose my company, right? So you cannot have that situation going forward. Likewise, if you've got a part-time programmer and he can only spend five hours a week, 10 hours a week programming something, uh, that's gonna have a direct knock-on correlation to a bug being fixed, to a major problem being fixed, everything so you've got to you, you know i'm thinking well from a purely professional point of view i want my team and this is why people still buy mayor by the way is because they know that if they have a major problem on a film they can phone up because remember autodesk will often have a deal where they'll supply the seats cheaper to a big animation company in order they can get the credit for using their software on that film right which then enables them to sell more copies so it, but it also means that if you're working on that film and you have a bug, you phone them up and they fix it right straight away. And so the next day or two days later, three days later, you'll have that that bug fix come back and you're sorted and you 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 know Marvel is suddenly getting its you know latest effect completed, right? So th so that is a, again a major thing I have uh, why people would still buy mayor right and, and, and would want to buy mayor which is great so if we were going to do this you know when people are saying oh i want i only want to spend 200 pounds on it or i would like it to be free well the moment you're free you can't have the programmers you got then they've got to work for charity basically for free and at which point you're a hobbyist tool and you you in a big proper in production environment as a major company am i going to want to buy blender uh, am I going to want to have Blender as the main software in my pipeline on mission critical shots? Uh, I think that's where that has that problem. From a mass market end user point of view, and if you're a hobbyist, absolutely the right way you know to go. So why, where does Lightwave sit? Lightwave sits kind of in the middle of that. It needs to be low enough cost that a normal animator, normal person could afford to buy it. But the upside has to be if it's being used by professionals and whatever, is that we make it applicable to them and updated and debugged as it goes on fast enough that makes it rock solid for them to use as well. And then there's the other thing is I want it to be able to be, you know, usable for everybody, architecture, uh, anime, um, you know, boom, boom, boom. So then we look at the current light wave and we say, well, OK, there are two light waves. <laughs> there's light wave 2015 and then there's light wave 2020 right um they're different paths they don't are they the same path or are they different paths well the moment they put the new engine in 
and stop the old engine working, which was bad for the anime people, you've got two products. So am I buying one product or two products? I'm buying two products. So one path is, okay, let's look at the, uh, for the Japanese market and for those people wanting to do that style of animation, let's not screw it up anymore. Let's, let's start developing again, 2015. So that's one thing I think is worth doing is we, we as we get more money, We'll, we'll put some money dedicated into 2015 and start upgrading that on its own path for now, right? 2020, uh, obviously, we've got a massive amount of things we can get done for that, and it's unlimited, really. I, I think uh, whether we change the render engine on that, whether we stay with that render engine, add other render engines, we've got the scope, because we're starting from scratch, to do anything we want to do. So... In a nutshell, that's really that was the that's the tipping point for me five years ago. Was actually that's what makes me want to buy them. Was I looked at the market, was thinking about where they were going, and and if you look from where they were five years ago to where they are now, have they done that much in that time? No. Can I beat that? Yes. Obviously, I'm I'm the gamble is, can I persuade enough old lightweight users? To come back can i keep the lightwave users who are currently using it on board and hope they bear with us while we do this and then will i better attract new animators i think attracting new animators yes i'll be able to do that i think we we make a good enough feature set they're going to want to use it and I, I i used to say this at the uh, uh, at nab and numerous shows at the time when lightwave was doing really well and bear in mind i was demonstrating after in retrospect, after the peak, right? So I was demonstrating it then, and I, I was saying, well, the biggest question you need to ask, you know, with this function, this function, this function, if your if your opposition is using Lightwave and they have those advantages over your piece of software here, um, and you don't have Lightwave, are you going to lose the job you're bidding for to those people who can do it quicker, faster, better, bang, right? That's what Lightwave needs to bring back into the mix. It, it currently animates, I, I, I personally believe it's the fastest animation interface still available, currently available. And I, I, and so that is a major plus, right? So let's get then the other things fixed and start adding some new uh, major features uh, into that mix. And then it's gonna be back to that question. Does your, your piece of software enable you to do what that's doing um, uh, quicker? Uh, and if it doesn't, then if you're competing against people, you will lose the job. You have to have Lightwave in your mix. And that's what we need to try to do. And obviously, you know, the question about adding in uh, Unix versions and all those things is right up there with things we've got to think about um, uh, uh, you know, as we go forward. So, yeah, that was a, was a hefty old answer to a lot of... <laughs> Very long answer, so, yes. <laughs> it was, but it's a big question. Yeah, there's a big question, and yeah, I mean, you answered a bunch of questions there because you were saying like, why are you coming back to light? Why, why do you come back to Lightwave even though you have access to Maya, Blender, and you have pointed yeah. out that that because Lightwave's interface when it comes to animation is so direct, it's there and it's super direct and and very, what do you say? It, it's not hard to use. Uh, it, it's right there. Is that, it's easy. Yeah, it's easy, yeah. right? And that and that is the number one thing. Thing you you say this is why I use Lightwave for certain things. It, it, did I understand you correctly? Yeah. Do you, do you know actually? I just popped in my head, and I hadn't thought about this before. But actually, if we highlighted with a slightly different color the buttons that are e make it easy to animate, and I, I, it, it, it could be as simple as that. All, when people look at the interface currently, they see a line of, you know, a huge complicated set of menus, right? And actually, they have to hunt for move, rotate, you know, the, the dumb things. But actually, if we just highlighted them with a slightly different color gray, I, I don't know if it's that simple, but it, it, it just literally, you know, why not? Why not just do that? Why not just for now? Why not I just do that 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 button that 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 are, are the ones that enable you to do all the key things you want to do in every package but you'll better see them quicker because they're they're a slightly different color anyway that, uh, andrew remember that and remind me i said that i'll try uh, 
I'll try. Yeah. <laughs> it um, cool. I mean, I think I think getting it, it needs to. It, it's that kind of very fine art of getting getting the interface more simple, um, without losing, but actually having under the hood way more complexity is is the art of is what you need with like if you want it so that when it comes up not not like toy like because i think some uis do that wrong don't they and make it look very like oh and this, like for kids it's like no it's not for kids it's for grown-ups but yeah. have it very very simple obvious and apparent what it is that you're doing so i'm right what am i doing now i'm moving this arm right i'm i'm looking there's a modifier here right all of that needs to be is plain and in your face and right there and immediate and and, and quick so that the animator can just get on with a task, which is exactly what you say. Same thing is equally apply to modeler. You know, it's a direct modeler. People still love that. You know, is, is there better modelers? There's a load of better modelers, but people still keep coming back to Lightwave because of the direct instant interface and just streamlining that, getting rid of the duplication, you know, making it so that it's easier to do complicated things. And you, yes, you, you, you click a panel, and wow, you've got a load of nodes and you've got a load of extra stuff for the power animators, the power users that want all of that feature. But yeah. for the basic, you know, before you need that, you need a, a very basic, you know, blocking it out, getting the rough thing that you want in there as quick as possible so that you can go, right, here's my 10 minute pass of the animation. What do you think of that? Right, I like that. Right, let's put in some physics simulations. Let's get the smoke. Get let's get the all of those higher end features, which yes, inevitably become more and more complicated. But there's nothing you can do about that. But getting that initial kind of, as you say, um, major thing, and and, and as you, people like that, especially freelancers. Um, and it's and it's it is one of the strengths. It's, as you said, it's the reason why people keep coming back to Lightwave, and hopefully we can improve that. You know, going down that path. You know, when you have um, uh, the, the analogy, if you look at like a music sequencer, you have um, you don't. So in Logic, you have the music sequencer. You can do your recording. You have your, basically a line of tracks, right? And then basically, if you want to call up the mixer. You click a button, and up comes the mixer. And then you can do the mixing. And then you click the button that goes away. And you click another button to call up a, a you know a, a different kind of sequencer and, and so on and you just have the bits up that you need so the idea of a compromise interface is uh, avoided on music sequencers because they do it that way right so they don't have a compromise interface they have the best interface for recording and then you add on the best interface for mixing and then you you know bang and the irony is with 3d it seems to me that everybody only thinks it's better to have one interface right so, you know, you've heard the argument, Andrew, probably as many times as I have. Well, can we, you know, isn't it about time it was all one interface? And and um, I get that. And that's because the others have all done that. Now, Soft Demarge did it by actually having an extra menu. And so they had three menus plus the bottom uh, part. So you could fit a lot more menus on there. But it was, you know, it, it was good, a good design interface, by the way, the, the Soft Demarge kind of thing. Soft Demarge probably is my favorite of the interfaces. Um, uh, past and present. Um, so uh, very, very good indeed. Anyway, so let's let's talk about a few things. Modeler, layout, hub, and then think about Unreal and Unity for a second as well. So actually, I'll deal with them because they're quick. Let's deal with them just just spot on for a sec. So Unreal Bridge is staggering in its capability, and it, Elmar has got some plans to enhance that significantly beyond that. And obviously, we also want to do that with Unity as well, right? To make the same kind of interface for that. Um, there is therefore a very good call to having a good link with the um, with those guys, with the Epic guys, and, and basically potentially using the Unreal Engine uh, inside Lightweight potentially um, as a as a visualization tool, and also of course uh, uh, there is a massive market in the gaming industry. If you could supply them with a perfect animation interface for uh, Unreal, that would be a, again a whole massive new market for Lightwave. Um, it, obviously, Lightwave has never been publicised as having the Unreal Bridge. No one's ever advertised it. Um, it's barely been mentioned. 
but it's been there for ages. But of course, it, it just needs to be updated on a very regular basis. So that that is a case of Unreal gets updated, you know, two or three times a year. You need to keep up with that in that particular case. Again, we need to have a programmer doing that all the time, right? So that's that. So um, there is a very good case for doing that. And, and again, on a lot of the real-time production elements of production today, um, nearly all, well, I say nearly, actually all of that is, is really done with the Unreal Engine. So that's that. So let's just talk about the Unreal Engine. What? How do they manage to get things to look that good and you see all the demos and, oh, my God, that looks so real. Um, loads of it are place cards with stuff on them as opposed to being full geometry. And then all the near geometry can handle massive data sets of geometry um, with relatively limited control, but very well. Right. So it handles some bits brilliantly well. Some bits are a deliberate hack to make things work faster. And then like their water solver is brilliant, but you can't really call it absolutely photoreal. You can call it damn good, but you can't call it photoreal, right? So it, there is a, it, but it, but for doing virtual sets where you're doing a spaceship in the background, mountains, terrain, running up to here, and maybe a, you know, you know, the old spacecraft flying through it, it looks fantastic. So. It has a place, and Lightwave already has that built in to make that work with that. No one knows about it. We've got to get that publicity out there, and we've got to do a few improvements, get it up to date. That's that's something we need to relaunch, right? And much more needs to be made on that. So Unreal, uh, um, you know, it's like one of the best kept secrets. So if you want a reason to buy Lightwave right now, and you want to produce real time television or get into real time television. Lightwave with Unreal is actually an excellent way forward, straight off the bat. Forget Lightwave's last 15 years, forget all the crap. Actually, you want to be able to animate, put scenes together really quickly, which is exactly what Lightwave does. And actually, you want to do that as fast as possible and transfer it across to Unreal. That it does great, right? We can improve it, but it does that great. So that, that's a reason to have Lightwave right now. And by the way, there's a lot of architectural companies use it doing the visualization of um housing i say housing estates we're talking you know posh ones <laughs> but they do all their visualization of fly arounds in real time using lightwave with uh, unreal it's like their secret weapon Iro ironically i think uh, uh mashir abs uh, uh is it mashir no no it's uh uh, uh meraki meraki oh, i think it's meraki sorry is it khalid the the one who works for meraki studios yes yeah. oh, it's yeah, on, he's just brilliant. He's done some beautiful stuff. And, bef and before the Unreal thing, you know, I mean, he was doing that. It was he was a secret weapon, wasn't it? Um, using Lightwave. Yeah, it, it, it did. It did some brilliant stuff that it was ahead of its time when he did it. Um, and it's and it's still, you know, I mean, obviously, he may have moved on. I don't know, but um, having the well, Unreal bridge. I've been looking at the stuff he's been doing uh, over the last year, and he's um, he's pumping out absolutely. He's basically. What's happening on? Uh, he's doing with real environments. What's being done on uh, um, the Mandalorian? You yeah. know, so basically, the Mandalorian's being done uh, with real time with the Unreal Engine. He's doing that with Lightwave and the Unreal Engine, but for massive building projects across the Middle East. And he bats it out the ballpark because no one can do what he does as fast. And why? The combination of the two pieces of software he's using does that. And I think he uses other software as well. He's using other engineering software, presumably 3D Studio Max and whatever. But he's, you know, that's how they pump that stuff out, and they do it exceptionally well. And there, and that, that's only one of many companies doing that worldwide. Um, so that that's that. Um, so, uh, but by the way, just while it's in my brain, there are still a shed load of people using Lightwave in top production. At studios, and by the way, has it surprised me in what, this last month how many people came out the woodwork and said, "Oh, by the way, I think you'll find I'm still using Lightwave." <laughs> you know, these, these were guys at ILM and and at numerous studios. They don't talk about it anymore because they're almost embarrassed by it. But actually, they were still using it. And 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 if it, I can't, what's the chap who does the fantastic design work for all the major um, studios? He uh, based at Pinewood. Um, but he did the lightsabers and uh, oh yeah, yeah. I, oh what is his name now? I forgot it, but I know who who you mean. Yeah, yeah. And oh. he's unbelievably 
uniquely talented. I mean, I, I look at his stuff. Yeah. And I, you know, it makes me sick. I wish I was the half as good as he was. No, like, <laughs> he is brilliant and uh, and uh, amazing what he pumps out. And the point is, he's doing that all in lightweight. And that's for the biggest films in the world today and for the last 20 years. You know, it, it, why is he using it? And it's because it does it well for what he wants to do. And he knows it back to front. He pumps it out. Done. Anyway, so there's that. Um, so then let's go on to the modeler layout tool. So modeler is a mess. It's got stacks of plugins inside it that, that could be merged or made better. It needs tidying up and needs to be much faster. And it needs to be able to handle bigger data sets much easier. Uh, bang. So that's, that's out the room. So that we need to do, right? We know, we've got to sort that out. And I think, uh, uh, by the way, El Elmar uh, you know, will be the first to tell you the same thing. So that's a, that's a big task. That's one we're going to, it's going to take more than a year. <laughs> yeah, it, I, think, I think to paraphrase him, I'm sure he said the other day that it's the thing that keeps him up at night. <laughs> and not, not, Entirely in the back when we're, you know, Elmer's up at night for anything. He but, just does. He's one of those type of people. Yeah. Oh, I thought of this. And bang, is it? Anyway, yeah. but uh, so it, Modeler has a lot of work to do. It, it's had the least love out of layout, and the Modeler layout was being updated quite heavily under the under the skin. Modeler's had less of that. Has been started upon, but needs a lot more work. Um, so, uh, so first of all, why keep Modeler? not integrate it into, light, into layout. So the first thing I suppose is, if we integrate modeler into layout, it won't be current layout. It will be an entirely more cluttered interface with a lot more complications. Technically, we could perhaps do a little button where you click on that button and the interface changes to be a modeling interface. Um, but then we could do that now and just pretend we didn't have the hub, but obviously you still would. <laughs> so the, the, you know, the reality of that is we could make it so it looks like a one interface interface if you want. But but I but I'm not sure that's really the answer. The answer is to make the best modeling interface. Period. If we can make that modeling interface as good as the best modeling interfaces around, with the same kind of tools in the best modeling interfaces, that then becomes something that becomes a a great tool for people across the world, for designers, everything. Great, right? Um, the question is, is then what tools in there would also be good in layout? And what are you trying to achieve in layout that would need that? So you might want to have, um, you know, things that can make cables and pipes. You might want to have things that can cut shapes out of shapes. You might want to have the ability to do deformation uh, uh, better in, in layout. You know, there's all kinds of things we can do. Um, and by the way, that could also be paint programs uh, for doing a te a texture painting over time in layout would be really good. So, you know, if we could do add bullet holes, scorch marks, boom, 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 you know, again, for VFX people, but also for people having fun uh, on a timeline inside layout, wouldn't that be fantastic? Yes, it would. In that case, I think we better do it. So, and so you, you know, that's the kind of stuff we've got to think about. So the first thing is make the modeler as good as it could possibly be. So, uh, it, you know, if you can get that to be, um, uh, you know, modern tools, a bit more like Modo, some great talk sets of tools in there. Um, get that up to, to where that needs to be. That will do that. The transfer between the two uh, is handled actually remarkably well in, in by the hub, but that needs to be updated too. So the hub is, is a missed opportunity for me. The hub basically almost, and it was actually Elmer who wants to inter integrate it, um, almost had the ability to, to have the ability to plug into the hub at one point. Uh, and so you could add more functionality through the hub and even attach other programs through the hub. It has a potential to still maybe take in that path. We don't know until we really look at the code how difficult that's going to be. But obviously that would be lovely if we can look at that and actually make that significantly better. Why then couldn't that hub be something that becomes useful to people using, you know, uh, third party programs, other programs, they could just log in through the hub, share work, uh, you know, have multiple animators working through projects through the hub. You know, why can't you make that a much more functional thing? Now at that point, layout modeler and hub become actually the next generation of program, not the past generation of program. So if you look at that and think, well, let's take 
what is what some people see as a weakness and actually go, well, actually, it could be its greatest moment. Actually, that is something worth really looking at. So we 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 obviously a month in. Um, you know, we only really got access to the code a week and a bit ago. So you know, even though we had it, there were certain things we couldn't get up and running straight away. So we're only at the very beginning stage of looking at this stuff. But and and it may be may, it may well be impossible. You know, we may look at it and think actually that's just not going to now be possible. But if it is possible, and if we can improve that, even if that's going to take us two years to do that that would be a path I would really be interested in. When it comes to, you know, Lightwave, uh, and you, you guys are going to, to start selling Lightwave again and develop it, you might get new users that comes from other tools like Maya or 3D Studio Max as examples, right? And yeah. one of the things that I really like with, uh, let's say, Motion Builder is that when you start it up, uh, you can actually choose from a bunch of different, you know, do you want to have the keyboard shortcuts from Lightwave and the mouse, uh, you know, the way the mouse works in, in Lightwave? Or do you want to have it from Maya or 3D Studio Max or Softimage? And I think that is a very, very cool, you know, thing to have because it makes it easier for, for you know, new users that come from another package to pick up, pick up uh, Lightwave. So... What are your thoughts about that going forward, uh, developing Lightwave? So, okay. so it, it, first and foremost, it, obviously you're going to get a lot of people who will be coming back from having been Lightwave users who've then moved to Softmarge or uh, Maya or whatever the case may be, and then they decide to come back. Right. So, so it, it's it's a very good point. They'll have learned new keyboard you know commands over the last few years and. Obviously, it's always difficult when you change subject going back and, and not having that instant capability. So first and foremost, obviously, Lightwave's keyboard, mouse, all of that is configurable. So you can change all the keyboard commands. You can change all the mouse commands. You can switch um, you know, to left, right-hand side of the mouse for you know, switch the functions, etc. On top of that, also, if some people maybe are using uh, a 3D mouse, that's all built into Lightwave as well. So give me one second and grab that. So you know, things like, I don't know if you've ever seen one of those. Yeah, so that's a 3D mouse, right? So that enables you to fly around. So all of those things are usable in Lightwave as well as standard. So it has all the things you need to, to make it compatible with other people's working methods, plus a, a, a whole load more. So Rob actually did a, a, a fantastic job of uh, putting in a lot of controls or enhancing or getting the controls to be better, basically, for doing virtual set uh, stuff. So you could do fly arounds, those sort of things. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff in there. So that's the first thing is that if anybody's coming from another package, it, they could, worst case scenario, configure their own uh, uh, shortcuts. However... Um, we were talking about this the other day, and, and we not sure. Obviously, it's down to priorities. Our first priority is to get the um, some of the bugs fixed and all the features that we've got planned, get them done, and make sure they're working great for the first release. However, that said, one of the things we've also got is a bunch of very, very good beta testers and and um, you know a bunch of people who want to help. So. There's no reason why, and maybe we should put this uh, out um, either maybe this week or even the week after, but maybe ask people if they're willing to help set up keyboard configs for the package that they like to use other than Lightwave, right? So if they're a Blender guy who loves Blender but wants to come back to Lightwave, they're obviously going to know the keyboard commands uh, um, for that package very well, and why not? get them to help put together the configuration. We then just basically put that in as a preset option uh, and set up and actually have that in the launch uh, build. Same goes for Houdini um, and any other package we want to add. So fundamentally, the answer is absolutely yes. And uh, I think we, we talked about this uh, um, uh, when we were doing the earlier uh, part of this interview, um, that... Um, we wanted to try to make life as easy for animators as possible. So, you know, if we add something, 
it's not just about adding something that is a dead end. It's about trying to always think how we can improve the end user's operation of the software and then try to make sure that uh, is implemented. And this is literally a, a, a fantastic example of that. Um, anything we can do to make users' life easier uh, coming from another package uh, has to be a priority. And I think either we can do some of that in-house, some of it can be done um, by our uh, beta, beta testers or even uh, the, the partners we've now got, the guys who've uh, uh, been early adopters, some of them will want to help. So I think, I think it's a brilliant idea and uh, let's try to get that implemented. Um, we've got to them. <laughs> so uh, let's do it. It's a good idea. The thing is that um, when I was, uh, oh, I can't remember when this was, and which I think it was light with 11, maybe light with 10, and we were using it, and there was this animator from Maya. And what we did was to use, uh, I think it was called Auto Hotkey or something like that, because I think Lightwave has hard coded shortcuts for when you want to let's say if you want to rotate you you, you press alt right and then you rotate but then yeah. if, if you zoom you have control alt and then there's something is is shift alt con out, shift alt and control to yeah. do another thing and maya doesn't really do that but with with the help of auto hotkey it actually allowed us to to change the behavior so that actually behaved exactly like Maya. So yeah, yeah, that that's that's my concern here is that that uh, that these there's, things, there's, there's some hard coded stuff, right? Yeah. So I suppose there's, there's, so let's let's talk about that. There's there's a couple of points there. One is obviously there may not be some things we can get done straight away and we might need to think about how we remedy that longer term. But the hard coded stuff that's built in, there's a load of stuff that is hard coded in, like the language onto the uh, uh, keys of the of, of Lightwave, so on the buttons of Lightwave. So there's a lot of those sort of things you would be really good uh, to have them so they're editable, because we want to do different language versions easily. Now, this was something that, that New Tech, um, and I, it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong, made a, an, a, a, a basic decision that every time someone took a screen grab with Lightwave in it, it would have the same look and feel um, wherever that picture was taken. So if, if someone was Spanish, it would still be in English, right? And the only one that, that varied to that, I think, was the Japanese version, which uh, Yoshi uh, changed. So, um, so the, the, the point about that is, that was because they deliberately didn't want anybody to ever do a grab that was different. Now, we don't feel that way. So we think, actually, we want to have a Russian version, Chinese version, Portuguese version, you know, basically versions for as many countries as we can. And, you know, some, sometimes you've got to think about that down to the quantity of users. So you, it might take long to do some territories than others, but there's no limit to that once you've decided that's what you're going to do. So again, it, it, it's not necessarily something that's our number one priority right now, but we are definitely going to be looking at how we can unlock that stuff, stop it being uh, um, uh, uh, non-destructible, if you like, and, and make it destructible and adjustable. And then we want to have language versions. Um, so uh, actually, it was one of the chats uh, uh, we talked about maybe highlighting certain colors on buttons that basically enable uh, um, a brand new user to, to have an almost like an overlay that makes certain buttons a lighter color that they know that's going to be move, rotate, you know, those sort of things, right? And uh, to make it much easier for them to learn. So again, I, I asked the question, then it suddenly dawned on me, of course, they've hard locked um, into groups of colors. So you kind of, at the moment, will need to unlock that as well to do that. So there's a whole range of things there that we definitely will want to do. Some of the things we won't be able to do straight away purely because we've got other, other priorities, but it will be on the list. I would definitely say by release three, 
may even be quicker if it's if it's doable. But right now, the 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 number one priority is obviously getting the the things done that we've got planned. You know, we've got bug fixes to do, tidy ups to do, the plugins that we're currently working on, which are going great, by the way. I saw one of the, the geo nodes the other day, and uh, my oh my. And that's where we will end part one of the interview with Andrew Bishop. <laughs>